at 8.34 into the KUAM News Zoom Room we go where Education Superintendent John Fernandez is sitting by. Good morning, John. Off day. Good morning, Chris, uh, Sabrina, uh, Jason, and, and uh, Joe, sir. Yeah, good, good to see you guys again this week. Yeah. Uh, good there's, morning. There's definitely a couple things. Uh, well, there's always so many things going on with DOE, uh, but I just kind of wanted to start with, uh, I, I believe we ran a story on the uh, three break-ins that have occurred up at BP uh, Carbolito uh, back-to-back this week. They got broken into last week. Uh, we're also hearing uh, Antalon as, as well, John. And this is this is nothing new, right? Um, but it's something that maybe we didn't hear as much of during uh, the pandemic. But I guess we'll just jump right to what a lot of people probably feel is a solution with the security cameras. And just, I guess, your reaction on these break-ins and what we can do to uh, kind of mitigate this thing in the future. Yeah, we're working on uh, we're working on it. I mean, it, it was you know you're right that it's not necessarily a new uh, issue that we've had to deal with over the years, uh, but but when you see things like this, I mean, you you do um, reflect on how quiet things were during the shutdown when when everybody was kind of stuck at home and you didn't have these issues. So uh, we're we're definitely working with the schools. Um, you know, again. Uh, right now, we you know we know we we know that Antalon and Carbolito have seen repeated attempts uh, at breaking in, as well as um, uh, Price Elementary had an earlier incident. But you know it's a kind of a it's a real concentrated area that we're working on right now with GPD to really um, you know kind of get gather intelligence on on who these perpetrators might be, uh, because again, um, just based on the the information from the investigations. Uh, they're, you know, these are, they seem like kind of targeted uh, areas that are being, you know, um, being, being, ident- being ad- ad- addressed. And, um, you know, some attempts are, are not successful. I mean, there's, there may be some damage as people try to break in, but, um, you know, we're, we're, we're a little frustrated by it. We, we've noticed, uh, you know, some breaks in the fence that have been repaired and cut and, uh, mm-hmm. and so forth. So right now, you know, we're working hard with um, the police department to gather um, information because, you know, it seems like a pretty, you know, uh, a pretty um, narrow geographic area we're talking about. And we know and we hope that people in the community and the villages have um, maybe may have seen something out of the ordinary around these schools. And we do hope and we we do uh, ask that the community participate in sharing that information with the schools and with the police. Um, you know, if they've seen anything over the past weeks, uh, weekends, uh, past couple of weeks, that you know, that maybe it caught their attention, but um, they didn't necessarily inform anybody, because we do, uh, we are on the watch for um, for um, you know people who are looking at you know s- scoping out and attempting to to break into these facilities. Uh, we mm-hmm. do have a couple of uh, initiatives underway to you know internally to try to address the situation. Um, you know, as you might guess, we you know we, we've done so much to try to be transparent about you know throughout this pandemic about what we're doing and how things are going, and you know especially what we are investing in in terms of bringing things to support our schools. And one of our concerns has been, boy, as we talk more about you know what what we're purchasing and and, and putting at the schools to support our our children, we also want to you know we're also concerned that we're that we're creating targets for those who might have ill intent. So, um, you know, we don't necessarily want to share directly what those strategies might be to combat uh, this. What we'd like to do is put those in place, work with our partners uh, at the police and in the community, and hopefully identify who these perpetrators are so that we can, um, you know, address them appropriately and end this, um, you know, end these series of incidents at at these schools. Mm -hmm. Uh, So as you uh, shore up security and surveillance um, at, at the schools, can you at least speak to uh, what kind of damage was done at these schools? Because like six classrooms, I think I saw, were broken into. And I think it was at Carbolito. I mean, are they actually going in there and stealing things? Or are they just going in there and just breaking stuff? And, and damage? Yeah, right now it's, it's almost as if they're kind of exploring, you know, the, the, the school areas. And, you know, initially uh, we were lucky to have um, you know, the security alarm security alarms in areas that, you know, needed that extra protection, and, and that, you know, even though there was a break into the schools, when that alarm went off, that was you know helpful in in uh, mm-hmm. deterring them from further activity that evening. So we want to build around and enhance you know those types of uh, measures, and as well as eyes on campus. Uh, so we're trying to address 
we don't, I mean, again, with regard to, we, you know, we're still collecting a lot of the information of what may have been um, <laughs> an address, but you know, in some incidents we have food missing. Uh, and on the line, we had the robotics uh, kits that were taken. Um, they actually came back to that very same room, you know, in a, in a later visit and, you know, they, they couldn't get in, but they damaged the windows. So, you know, I, part of me suspects that it might be, you know, young, you know, young adults or teenagers uh, kind of getting on campus and, you know, just up to no good. Uh, we hope it's nothing further than that, as, you know, that, that these are real, they're not, these aren't adults who are, you know, doing you know, more nefarious plans in mind. But again, we're really, uh, we were on the phone with the uh, Chief Ignacio, you know, our team was trying to figure out uh, how we could increase presence uh, around those schools, both uh, with GPD and with, uh, you know, our village partners. So um, again, you know, we're, we're, we're knocking on wood that, you know, these are only a couple of schools and the repeated breakage kind of indicate that, you know, we might be able to identify, you know, these perpetrators if we just uh, work together and share information uh, that hopefully from our community members as well as to what they might have seen in terms of people on campus, around campus, you know, checking the fences and so forth. So we, we really ask for the village to, to keep eyes on the school, especially in, in the evenings, on the weekends, and um, share that information. I think if, we, if, we're, if we're talking to each other, we can easily identify who those uh, individuals might be who shouldn't be, you know, at Carbolito or at Antalan. Uh, when they're not, you know, outside of school hours. Uh, John also wanted to ask about this. Uh, well, the results that came out yesterday with GDOE confirming the three individuals testing positive for COVID-19. The first case identified as a student from Carbolito. Uh, second, a student attending Rios Middle School. The third, a student at JQ uh, San Miguel. It says uh, GDOE Public Health have identified and notified all close contacts. Uh, areas of all three campuses have been cleaned, disinfected, in preparation for face-to-face -face, uh, instruction. Can you just kind of walk us from the genesis of these three positives to where we are now? Well, you know, I think the the issue with uh, a positive at schools is that if you see, as you see uh, the numbers, you know, fluctuate in the community, you know, you can anticipate that you might see that mirrored in our schools. And uh, you know we're lucky that we've only seen a few incidents here and there, and these incidences might affect one child or one household, but um, you know we haven't seen any evidence of spread within the school campus. We typically uh, see <laughs> associated with a household, you know, with a household case that might be affecting the family, and once we identify um, the, you know, the children, uh, we're able to quickly you know mitigate, um, you know, go through the contact tracing identify parents, teachers, you know, and, and address, uh, you know, take the, take the measures we need to, to prevent any spread of COVID-19. What's assisted us in these cases has been the fact that, you know, we still are on an alternating schedule mm -hmm. with students coming into school. So I think that's assisting us right now and, it, and, it's, and it's allowing us to really reinforce the mitigation measures, uh, but it's something that we're gonna have to really focus on when kids come back to school for more than one day um, you know, a week. So if we're going five days a week. That's when we're going to really have to buckle down and pay attention to the numbers and and our and our mitigation measures. But but so far, you know, you can definitely anticipate. And and what we've seen is that these cases that you're seeing in school are typically associated with cases that are happening in the family and at the household. And you know, there the fact that they're a student and our nurses are being notified um, doesn't mean that it's happening at the school. It just means that we have to prevent. Any for any spread, I've been really happy and, and and feel very confident in the measures that are being taken at the schools. Um, not just um, because we put the plan together and tried to reinforce it, but I've been out there at the schools and I've just been very pleased to see how the kids are are you know behaving on the, at the school site. You know we have this vision that kids are just going to be running around, not listening to the teachers, face masks off. But you know, you, you if you reflect on it, you you'll see that kids really follow the rules. Or for the most of them are going to be following the rules. You've got adults there reinforcing the rules, and from your pre-kindergartners up to your high schoolers and your middle schoolers, everybody is kind of you know doing the hand washing thing. They know the routine: the hand washing, the walking, the distancing, the face masking, and uh, it just gives me extra confidence that at the school level, the the safety practices are being. Uh, are being reinforced, or that the kids are being educated and reminded, and we're not having trouble 
uh, at least at this stage, with uh, being able to manage that. Now, obviously, next year we're preparing to figure out what happens when there are more kids on campus. How do we provide more mm -hmm. supervision? But when it comes to uh, looking at our mitigation measures, when we do have a case, uh, what public health does when they come in and try to identify contacts, it really is a very narrow circle because of the way we're operating in school. So I think that's, uh, you know, really good news. And I'm, I'm glad to have seen that. And I tell them, I said, you know, it's not the kids I'm worried about anymore. I mean, the kids are just following directions really well. Uh, I mean, it's a, it might be sad just to say this, but they, they've adjusted to this kind of new normal probably much easier than many of us adults have, right. um, especially mm -hmm. outside in the community. So mm -hmm. um, so again, we see these cases, these are isolated cases. Uh, when we do see more than one case at a school, obviously our attention focuses on whether, you know, how, when, when, whether these are related and how they're related. And we have seen cases where their siblings have been affected, um, you know, or, or, or members of a class have been, um, you know, um, identified. And then we go in to try to figure out if there's any evidence of spread. And so far, um, there hasn't been any evidence of spread because once we get into the information and the background and the timing, um, we know that these are isolated cases. And uh, I think the schools are doing a great job of responding, you know, once they get the information. Is, is GDOE uh, uh, in discussions with public health? Uh, uh, are there plans for GDOE to hold uh, vaccination clinics for 12 to 15 year olds? We uh, we definitely are um, in discussion with public health. We're, and we know the CDC just approved, um, you know, I, I, we just, just exchanged messages with the Lieutenant Governor where, you know, we're gonna be preparing to uh, start once they authorize uh, the testing here on Guam. I mean, the vaccinations here on Guam um, and so we're just, we're going to work out the details and the logistics behind that. We're going to try to, you know, if we follow the, the high school vaccination approach, we're going to try to, to do school-based um, clinics as much as possible uh, for the kids. But it's really, I think the, the, the challenge is we really have to work with parents and we have mm -hmm. to work uh, to get the message out in the community to uh, make sure that, that everyone is educated uh, about the vaccines, about their availability. And, um, you know, for those who want to, to take advantage, we, we want to make it as easy as possible for them to access those vaccines because we're heading into the summer now. I mean, it's close to the end of the school year. And so what we worry about is over the summer, we lose some of that contact, right? So we're trying to figure out how we can uh, increase the contact with students normally over the summer, how we get the message out and how we, um, you know, facilitate the vaccinations. And, you know, one of the challenges, you know, with the, with the high schoolers, I think we have a lot of high schoolers, once they heard about it, they're like, okay, I'm going to go and tell my parents I want to go get the vaccine. And we've seen a lot of that. With the middle schoolers, you know, you're dealing with the 12-year-olds uh, and then the 15-year-olds. And the 12-year-olds are still the kids who are like, man, I don't want to, I don't like shots. I don't want to get a shot. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, we're going to have to John. pass different. My seventeen-year-old, my seventeen-year-old got the vaccine yesterday, and he was like, "I don't like getting shots." So it's not just the twelves, right? But you can, you know, the kid, you know, that that age group. Some of them are not are going to be uh, aware of the vaccine and COVID, and some of them are going to look at it as another needle. And boy, I don't like needles. So we're going to have to do our work to message to this, you know, to these different age groups, and and try to. Again, we're not mandating it, and we understand some of the 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 the, the uh, concerns that people have and their comfort level, but we do want to continue to educate and share information about the vaccines. And we do want to make it available, um, you know, and, and try to overcome the obstacles to uh, getting those vaccines. So, we're, you know, for, so for instance, we're tracking our employees. We're trying to get to that 70, 80% range and we're getting close. And I you know, spoke to a teacher yesterday and she said, you know, she was one of the few that's, oh, I haven't been vaccinated yet. And we said, well, you know, what's the challenge? Are you concerned? And she said, no, I just haven't had time yet. So, you know, some of them might just see it as a time management. Some do have real concern. And, you know, again, part of it is just continue to educate our employees and then also the students who want to take advantage of the opportunity. Right. And also it has to be accessible to parents, working parents. I mean, right. That's the other thing is that because the parents need to be with the students if they're minors. Parents need to be there to sign off consent. Uh, for the vaccination. So looking at, yeah, we discussed that about um, about adjusting the hours, uh, about looking at weekends and looking at village-based, uh, you know, approaches to make it easier for those who might have transportation issues and so forth. 
So yeah, we're, we're, we're in that stage of just active discussion, um, preparing for the announcement for the middle schoolers. Mm -hmm. um, anything on the $287 uh, million in ARP funds? Uh, there was a, a informational briefing earlier this week, but there was something right. wrong with the, the feed, so we couldn't uh, watch it. So. <laughs> right. Did you that, provide that, a, a, your... I know that was hopefully a very unintentional, that, but we have the information that we're, well, we basically what we said to the, what we said to the legislature is that we are anticipating finalizing our proposal around May 21st. And we spent a lot of time with the school stakeholders, uh, with the, with the you know, private schools or the charter schools, with our schools, trying to put together uh, a list of items of the of requests needed to ensure that we can sustain you know, uh, a safe environment for, for our kids uh, to come back to school uh, as, as we emerge, or hopefully emerge from this COVID-19 pandemic. So, you know, as, as I said before, you know, a lot of our focus of the first round of funding, ESF-1, was a lot about, about health and safety and immediate supplies and the shift in distance learning. So we started that with the PPEs and the investment in technology for more laptops, et cetera. You know, round two, was looking at reopening. So what do we need to do to start facilitating the reopening of schools? And round three is now gonna be how do we sustain those safe school environments? So what I can say at this point is that, you know, for, first of all, 20% of these funds have to be dedicated to learning recovery. So it is gonna, these are things gonna, that are gonna be in the classroom and out with our community partners to invest in our, in our um, you know, trying to catch kids up uh, from, from, the, you know, from the impacts of the, of the pandemic. And then the remainder, a lot of that remainder, will, will, a lot of it will be invested in capital improvement projects uh, to shore up our facilities. So uh, I, I was asked, you know, if I could identify some of those projects, and I didn't, I didn't want to do that at the at the hearing because we haven't finalized it. And you know what happens when you start announcing these projects? If anything <laughs> changes, you're still held to that. Uh, so we yeah. said, look, yeah, May twenty first is our anticipated date for putting pens and you know, pencils down and finalizing a, a proposal that we can then send to USDOE, share with the board, share with the legislature and the general public. Uh, but I would anticipate you'll see, again, you'll see a, a significant amount uh, targeting our, our facilities on Guam, as well as uh, you know, targeting learning, uh, the learning recovery efforts that'll be, uh, be needed as part of our, uh, you know, our recovery from the pandemic. All right, John. All right, well, thanks, John, for the, uh, the updates. No, no, thank you. And I know you were, you know, early on, I mean, yesterday I was down south, so I just yeah, wanted to let yeah. you know that, um, you know, I know you mentioned uh, early on before the, you know, during the break, uh, the empanada. So if you want to ever tour the schools down <laughs> south, it's also, they also help you with that empanada tour. So right. I tried different variations yesterday and, you know, I'm just kudos to the south for the hospitality, our southern schools. And then, um, and again, I, then I heard, you know, the, I know that uh, Joe's service really pushing that crispy potas uh, therapy. <laughs> for uh, COVID-19. So when that gets approved by CDC, please let me yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Hey, if you can survive crispy potas, you can survive anything. Okay. Thank you, John. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, John. There you go. Hey, yep. Yep, I got to say, Southern Empanadas tops, no cap. We got a shout out from the soup. <laughs> yeah, we did. Um, <laughs> Joe, sir, did. And what he's kind of referencing is we showed him during the break, guys. We kind of, you know, just been dabbling a little bit because, you know, obviously, look at me. You know, oh, I love the Chamorro empanada. Sorry, Brie, again. Mm. Oh, and there just happened to be a couple lumpia just for good measure. Just a couple of Tehran thrown in. Mm. Yep. This for my couple of buy-ins right there, the couple of buy-in cam. <laughs> and these are the, these are the uh, Filipino empanadas with, with the ground beef in it, right? There you go. Very low fat. Uh, 852. Let's keep it in the KUM News Zoom room. Jay, you want to jump in on this one, too? Uh, where we have the uh, president of the Guam Visitors Bureau, former governor, uh, Carl Guterres, who's also the permitting czar. So uh, definitely focus going to be on reopening uh, tourism as, you know, I was able to ask the governor just a couple days ago uh, in that uh, post-meeting press conference about uh, plans to reopen. And she said, yeah, we're, we're holding fast to those. Well, guess what? May 15th, that's the day after tomorrow. Uh, Let's he may, get... Uh, he may be on the phone at the moment. Okay. And so again, uh, former Governor Carl on, I think it might be on a call here. Yeah. Looks like it. Okay. Right. So if it's May 15th, we sure. should anticipate perhaps a.